On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Chris Franklin and Mr. Brian Chi on the show today. The passwords have overstayed their welcome, whether it's at your organization or at your household. MFA is a good start, but there needs to be more advanced, secure passwordless frameworks out there. We're going to have a discussion on what organizations to definitely consider. Plus, we have a great host roundtable for you today. We discuss 5G and what it means to have private 5G. We have a lot of applications and examples to go over, plus ways you can actually adopt it quickly. You definitely should miss it. It's quiet on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 499, recorded June 24th, 2022. No forklift left behind. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by FlexTrack, the proactive security management platform. Save time and increase productivity with the premier cybersecurity reporting and workflow management product designed to support the complete security lifecycle from assessment through remediation. Visit plextrack.com slash twit to claim your free month. And by Hover. Whether you're a developer, photographer, or a small business, Hover has something for you to expand your projects and get the visibility you want. Go to hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. And by Things Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. For 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee, go to canary.tools slash twit. Enter the code twit in the how do you hear about us box. Welcome to Twyatt, this week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world's connected. I'm your host, Louis Maresca, your guide through this big world of the enterprise. But I can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their fields, starting with our very own Mr. Brian Cheese, Net Architect at Sky Fiber, and all around tech geek. Chebert, how are you doing, my friend? What's been keeping you busy this week? I've been tinkering, but um, warning this is a soapbox. Uh, I was woken up this morning and saw the decision on overturning Roe versus Wade and was very, very disappointed in the U.S. Supreme Court. And I will say um, lots and lots of states are now chiming in saying, no, we're going to keep protecting women's reproductive rights. And um, I know Washington State's doing that. Hawaii was actually the first state in the union to uh, implement the protections. And I'm hoping more states do also. And my last pitch is vote, vote always, vote often, and make your displeasure known to your Congress critters. End rant. Amen to that. Thank you, Brian. Good seeing you, my friend. Well, we also have to thank, welcome back as well our senior analyst at IMDEA, and he's security and enterprise expert. He is Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, how are you doing this week, and uh, what's keeping you busy? Well, I'm a little bit less tired than I was this time last week because I've actually had a uh, a week of sleeping in my own bed, which is a darn good thing. Uh, it's given me time to work on some things uh, that are coming up. I've got some research that's going to be coming out in July. Looking forward to getting that published to all of the Omnia subscribers. Uh, also have a number of things that will be coming up on both Dark Reading and on LinkedIn. Uh, so I uh, hope people will follow me both of those places. And, of course, I'm getting ready for Black Hat. Now, we've only got about six weeks before Black Hat. And one thing I do want to let people know about, if you're going to be there on Tuesday of that week, we're having the Omdia Analyst Summit I and all my colleagues will be giving presentations, talking about our areas of specialty, and then doing some roundtables where we discuss the industry as a whole. The great thing about the Omni Analyst Summit is that it's absolutely free. So uh, head over to Dark Reading slash Omnia, and you'll be able to find the registration page. Would love to see lots of folks from the Twyatt Riot in the desert. Fantastic. That's one thing with IT professionals. They can't give up on free things. So hopefully you'll see a lot of 
a lot of attendees. So we'll see what happens there. Thanks, Curtis. Well, we have a pretty busy week in the enterprise, so we should definitely get started. So today we have lots to talk about. In fact, we talked a lot about passwords in the past, but I think they've overstayed their welcome. There's not just a need for getting rid of them, but there's a need for more advanced and secured passwordless frameworks as well. We're going to discuss what organizations should consider there. Plus, we here to offer you a host roundtable. That's right. We're gonna, we've discussed 5G in the past, but we want to talk a little bit about private 5G, what it means for you and some of the different applications and examples that go out there as well. Lots of exciting stuff to talk about. But first, like we always do, we do have to jump in this week's news blips. Now, it wouldn't be an enterprise week without at least an attempted leak, right? Well, the notorious spyware vendor NSO is at it again. This time it's informing EU legislators that five EU countries have used their Pegasus surveillance malware. And according to this Wired article, not only has this malware been abused around the world, the Google Threats Analysis Group and Project Zero have published findings that there are now iOS and Android versions in the wild as well. Now, Google researchers say they've detected victims of the spyware in Italy and Kazakhstan on both Android and iOS devices. Now, the Android version version gets the code name Hermit. Now, the issue Google has raised is the fact that vendors like NSO are enabling the proliferation of dangerous hacking tools, armoring governments that would not be able to develop these capabilities in-house. In fact, they track more than 30 spyware makers worldwide that, that actually offer an array of technical capabilities and levels of sophistication to government-backed clients. In their analysis of the iOS version, Google researchers found that attackers distributed the iOS spyware using a fake app meant to look like the Vodafone or my Vodafone app from the popular international mobile carrier. Now, in both Android and iOS attacks, attackers may have simply tricked targets into downloading what appeared to be a messaging app by distributing a malicious link for victims to click on. Now, we know Apple doesn't let you sideload things unless you've signed by or signed by a trusted Apple cert through or whether it's through their store or they've used accepted third party party um, uh, certificates uh, for that process. While attackers were actually able to distribute the malicious app because RCS Labs had registered with Apple's enterprise developer program, apparently through a shell company called 3 to 1 Mobile SRL, to obtain a certificate that allows them to actually silo apps without going through Apple's typical app store review process. Now, three out of six of the exploits are from for actually from public jailbreak exploits. The researcher shows that while not all actors are as successful or well-known as a company like NSO Group, many small and mid-sized players together in a rapid-growing industry are creating real risk for Internet users worldwide. Well, ready for some good news? Researchers say that only 3% of open-source software bugs are actually attackable. Now, application security and DevOps pros are overworked and overstressed, nothing new there, but data from a new study implies that a focus on fixing and mitigating only what's truly attackable could drastically reduce the strain on those teams. The new 2022 AppSec Progress Report by ShiftLeft suggests that a focus on attackable vulnerabilities can help AppSec and dev teams more effectively sift through issues. The new focus on software supply chain vulnerabilities, third-party risk, and multi-layer software dependencies had made application security much more visible and far more challenging than ever before. Face it, security teams and developers can only get to, say, X vulnerabilities in Y applications within any given time period. They need a way to make sure the ones they fix or mitigate with compensating controls are the vulnerabilities that count. The idea of analyzing for attackability involves, among other things, assessing factors like whether the package that contains the CVE is loaded by the application, whether it's in use by the application, whether the package is an attacker-controlled path, and whether it's reachable via data flows. As an example of why this is important, think about the Log4j vulnerabilities that were huge news a few weeks ago and caused many late nights and long weekends for DevSecOps teams. But the shift left report noted that 96% of the vulnerable log4j dependencies weren't attackable. Now, the devil, as always, is in the details. Teams and their management need to understand just how a service or application determines whether or not vulnerabilities are attackable. In addition, 
and attackability prioritization is only as good as the vulnerability data feeding into it. So it is caveat emptor for security teams to truly look under the hood to see how they source their vulnerability data. Well, a big thank you to Dark Reading for this article. And the headline is, VPNs persist despite zero trust fervor. Well, zero trust initiatives may be on the security roadmap for most enterprises today, but remote access architecture today is still highly dependent upon virtual private network technology. Newly published data shows that approximately 90% of organizations still utilize VPN in some capacity to secure remote access for their users. Meantime, across a broad population of IT and security practitioners, fewer than one in three say they have plans to or have begun to roll out zero trust access to supplant VPN. Sorry. The results are from a survey conducted by Sapio Research on behalf of Banyan Security, which reached out to 1,025 IT respondents, focusing the bulk of the research on the 410 who were aware of both VPN and Zero Trust network access. The study shows that among that group, a full 97% reported that adopting a Zero Trust model is a priority for them. Slightly over half of those aware of both VPN and ZTNA said they've begun to roll out zero-trust solutions. Well, in my opinion, the two technologies are not mutually exclusive and for a time will most likely coexist similar to how it has been common to still use SSL and SSH even if tunneling through a VPN. I'm of the opinion that within reason, a multi-layered approach would also provide for additional protection from a single technological breach. Within reason, keeping in mind that all this security comes with overhead. Because you, there continues to be a deficit in cybersecurity professionals out there. Now, some organizations are trying to grow them in-house, but others are trying to get people t- into the field before they hit the workforce. Now, according to this Bloomberg article, there are a set of summer camps imagined by the NSA offering a big a bit of funding there and a run actually run by independent institutions. Now the program Gen Cyber started with an eight camp pilot back in 2014. That was actually only a year after the NSA's reputation was severely tarnished by former contractor Edward Snowden's revelations about its surveillance techniques. Now it now consists of 102 camps across 38 states with at least 140 camps expected in 45 states next year. Now each runs five days with an additional session before and after. And to date, more than 20,000 teenagers have already attended these camps. And the goal is to ignite the interest in cybersecurity to people before they actually hit the professional world. Now, part of the program's mission is also to increase female and minority participation in the field. They actually now offer both male and female sessions for the camps. Now, coding and computer camps are new Everyone from tech giants to fashion models have started programs hoping to turn young minds toward Silicon Valley. But the NSA's version includes cryptography, lessons on thinking like an adversary, mock trials of real life computer security cases, as well as practical instruction in monitoring network traffic, making your own firewall and a password security. The camps also seek to help young people navigate cyber stalking and cyber bullying and knit cyber security considerations into daily Life Now, the summer camp teachers discuss cyber ethics on a daily basis, but they make little mention of NSA's own controversial history. No joke there. Now, the NSA won't stay, say actually how much they give to fund the free camps, but the National Science Foundation, which co-funds the project, has given more than $3 million some years. Then the Citadel says Gen Cyber awarded a $130,000 grant to run two courses this summer with additional sessions before and after equivalent to be more than $3,500 for each attendee. Now, if nothing else, th- what this is actually doing is actually infusing the idea of cybersecurity in the young minds early on in their lives and careers. It gives them some possible direction and it provides a level of importance to the concept. I, for one, hope more programs like these even on other technical areas, will actually help creative minds out there. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, we have the news bites. But before we get to the news bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week, Enterprise Tech. 
and that's PlexTrack, the premier cybersecurity reporting and workflow management platform that empowers teams to win the right security battles. Now, what if you could streamline the communication across the entire security department so that every team member could do their job more effectively? Now, from simplified data aggregation and reporting to integrated ticketing for remediation to analytics and visualizations for board reporting, PlexTrack touches every aspect of the security management workflow. Gain a real-time view of your security posture by bringing all your data sources together into one powerful platform. We can triage scanner results, generate powerful analytics and visualizations, assign remediation tasks, attest to your posture, and track progress over time. Now, as a satisfied PlexTrack client put it, quote, we see PlexTrack as part of our strategy to move quicker and be proactive. Now we have a real-time view of what we need to focus on, and I have an easy way of showing senior leadership. PlexTrack serves every aspect of the enterprise security team program with features designed to improve workflow, collaboration, and communication for each role, including red team data aggregation. That's right, import data from all of your automated vulnerability scanners and tools, triage and report results in half the time. They also have blue team remediation, assign remediation tasks right on the platform or through a simple integration with the ticketing tools your team already uses and track progress over time. Plus, they have stakeholder communication, use powerful yet simple analytics to attest to security posture and prioritize issues, tailor attestation and communication to the needs of both team members and to your C-suite. Continuous purple teaming assessment is there as well. Begin purple teaming or power up your current strategies with Runbooks, the best in industry tool for test plan execution. Security teams of all sizes and maturities can maximize the efficiency and effectiveness of their workflows with PlexTrack. Customers report that they see PlexTrack as a part of our strategy to move quicker and be proactive, that the platform has a five times return on investment in year one, and that it gives their cybersecurity operations a 30% increase in efficiency. PlexTrack improves the entire security engagement lifecycle by making it easy to generate security reports, deliver them securely, and track the issues to completion straight from the platform. Book a demo today. Try PlexTrack free for one month and see how it can change your life as a security professional. Simply go to PlexTrack.com slash twit and claim your free month. That's P-L-E-X-T-R-A-C dot com slash T-W-I-T. And we thank PlexTrack for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now time for the bites. Now, in our RSA episode, we talked a lot about passwords, password lists, MFA. You know, passwords themselves, they've definitely overstayed their welcome. And I think they're more trouble than they're worth. Now, we're, we talked about ditching passwords for MFA and, and how it's essentially a necessity going forward for organizations. But they, too, also present a bunch of problems. In fact, you know, we talked a lot, a lot about actually moving towards more advanced and secure password list frameworks, including biometrics. Um, in fact, you know, you guys have actually talked a lot about the facts that some organizations are actually mixing these things together, whether they're mixing 2FA, SMS, to maybe using tokens, to using uh, desktop agents. Um, and the problem with that is it just kind of institutes and creates a lot of confusion for organizations. I want to bring you guys in and, and talk a little bit about some of the options that are out there. Cheaper, I want to throw it to you first. You know, there are there are options right now for uh, organizations to adopt some more secure passwordless type frameworks. What are you seeing that's really kind of adopting faster than others? What are some of the newer ones that, that organizations are pointing to? One of the technologies that I've been seeing a lot of talk about is FIDO. And the FIDO Alliance has done a great job of trying to get rid of the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt behind MFA. Well, here is my complaint. It's still too complicated. Just watching the DevOps, well, DevSecOps channel at the University of Hawaii on people that are trying to convert their apps over, it's tough. There's a lot of little twiddly bits that you have to get into. And if you're not keeping up, you can inadvertently open your website to some nasty stuff. So 
OAuth, which is one of the big ones in this game, is great. And there's open source implementations of it, but you have to keep on top of it. And my other complaint is single sign-on is great, but if you, you know, accidentally don't keep up or you introduce um, some vulnerabilities into your single sign-on system, you may open the keys to the kingdom. And my last complaint is the authentication sources are still very much a competition on who's going to be what. Active Directory is wonderful. I like it. And I'm sure Lou likes it. He has to work with it every day. Um, within the university, it's been LDAP. And I will say this is one shot at the Microsoft licensing people. You are losing to LDAP for one reason and one reason only. FTE counts. Active Directory is licensed by total number of FTE users, but that includes alumni. So if universities want to keep in touch with their alumnus, which are a big source of funding, they're saying, no, we're not doing Active Directory. Active Directory, if it's there, is only going to be an afterthought. It's going to be LDAP because of licensing costs. And then a lot of hardware people are still going TACACS, T-A-C-A-C-S, um, which is wonderful. Uh, but TACACS is complicated to implement. And it's not, well, the current, some of the implementations are not very secure. So with these many moving parts and this much confusion, um, MFA, I don't think, is going to get too much traction until these vendors and these developers start at least having a meeting of minds. Anyway, so some of the things that worry me, so out of this dark reading article, uh, they're saying they're claiming in the article... 81% of hacking-related breaches are caused by password-related issues with only 36% of users that seem willing to make the jump to MFA. Those are kind of depressing numbers. So <laughs> I, I took some pot shots at Microsoft Active Directory. For, for that, I apologize to Mr. Liu, but <laughs> I'm sure there's some interesting things happening because you can have some very, very spectacular single sign-on solutions that have MFA. Um, and I know Active Directory is changing, and especially Active Directory in the cloud has made it a lot more approachable, especially on the per-seat per license costs. But what right. things can you share with us about where Microsoft is going with its products line? Well, you know, it's interesting you brought up FIDO because I think that the FIDO 2 standard is one of those things that's on the forefront of everyone's mind. And I think the challenge here, and I actually want to get Curtis's thoughts on this in a second, because I think the biggest thing is the fact that, you know, organizations continue to change, need to change how they are authenticating their users. And, you know, new technologies keep coming up. Big organizations like Apple, Google, Microsoft, the Actas of the world are moving to a lot more uh, of the newer standards, which couldn't can actually create some level of consumer and enterprise fatigue. You know, they, they're, they're getting tired of having to constantly change things or adopt things or, or move to something new. And, you know, and, and like I was saying, you know, we are adopting some of the newer standards in some of the things that we do, which means that would mean that organizations will need to kind of come along with us. And so that, that can be a challenge uh, across the board. And that could be a reason why things are actually adopting slowly. Another thing I actually see uh, that I want to add as well is, some of these newer technologies, sometimes they are doing things behind the scenes to verify things, the frameworks wise, that might require some level of latency. Like, for instance, they're verifying with multiple different uh, providers or they are trying to, uh, you know, use your biometric server uh, that you just, you know, attested to um, on your device and, and being able to get that information and apply. So you, the user is essentially waiting around for all of this to kind of go on. And in fact, there's some research by Microsoft that says only an average person's attention span is only approximately eight seconds. So they're, they're going to think things are slow and not want to, they might even close the page because things are kind of redirected and th doing things behind the scenes. So there's some complexities there. There's fatigue. People don't want to move on to the new things. And when they do move on to the new things, there's some technology challenges that go along with them that cause organizations some level of distrust to how useful and performant they are. 
So Curtis, I want to throw this over to you. Are you seeing this in some of the reasons, at least that's what I'm seeing in some of the organizations, why they're not adopting? Is is this some of the things that you're seeing as well? Well, I think that for some organizations, we're, we're finding that the real obstacle to moving away from passwords is that they consider passwords to be good enough. And as you well know, when you get to enterprise software, if you have something that's considered by management to be good enough, then it takes one heck of a perceived benefit to move people off of that. Why? Because it's expensive to move. Let's forget the number of, or the, the licensing cost or the cost of development or anything like that. A profound number of enterprise users essentially do computing by muscle memory. That's why I'm sure Lou can tell you that there is significant heartburn every time there's a change to a menu in one of the office app suite of applications. Why? Because there are users who are used to going to the first item to the right of the login, clicking once, going down six items, clicking, doing this. They don't read. They certainly don't try to understand what's going on. It's muscle memory only. So if you change things that require muscle memory, for example, going from passwords to any number of multi-factor authentication processes, it needs to show some real benefits. And simply saying it's more secure is not enough of a benefit to many, many organizations. In addition, we've got an awful lot of of different possibilities. I mean, there are things like one-time passwords that are based on on time signatures, SMS, email two-factor authentication, pushed two-factor authentication, universal two-factor authentication tokens, web auth, desktop agents. All of these are out there saying, hey, we're the thing that really needs to replace passwords. And the fact is that if you have a multitude of these being used by an individual's different services and applications, then the user fatigue is just as great as it is with different passwords. Now, there are a lot of companies out there trying very hard to move away from anything that requires any user authentication. When I was at RSA and even when I was at Splunk's conference, um, user behavioral analytics, uh, UBA, and user and endpoint behavior analytics, UEBA, are both seeing a lot of attention being paid to them because they can help determine how strong uh, a particular uh, login authentication sequence needs to be. If everything looks just like it always looks in terms of the individual and this computer logging in, then maybe you don't need anything at all. Whereas if you have a number of differences, you know, IP IP address and time of day and where they're trying to go, all these things, maybe you want to make it really challenging for the user to log in. So there are a lot of different things, but still, the biggest hurdle isn't dollars. It's good enough. Right. right. Yeah, I I think that, that you know this article actually brought out some really interesting facts is that they're trying to ingrain some of these things by using you know some organizations like for instance gaming organizations you know they are actually, they're actually infusing multi-factor authentication into their login so that younger folks actually get used to it so that it becomes more part of like you were saying muscle memory to use these types of technologies and I think that's interesting because that then gets people more often off of the password world and I think this also happens I've watched this actually in my kids uh, case they use um, you know specific things at school and they you know they started using password managers and they started using uh, authenticators that went and, that they used um, uh, via their email um, and so or, or MFA via their email so I think it's very interesting to see how that they're starting to get this early on and it gets more part of their muscle memory and their expectations uh, later on but you know cheaper I want to 
throw this back over to you because I think that the biggest thing here is there's no bulletproof solution out there. Some people are, are actually talking about uh, the squirrel protocol that's actually um, uh, Steve Gibson's protocol um, in there. And again, a lot of, a lot of good, unique things that are going on there as well. But there's no bulletproof protocol here. And I think like, like uh, Curtis has said, is it's really time challenging to actually integrate these things. And so they just kind of go fall back to passwords themselves. You know, what is an organization to do if these are really tough to actually implement and integrate and uh, is it just make sense to continue using passwords to just have policies around them? I think a lot of it is um, there are some suggestions out there. Squirrel is definitely one of them. Um, the folks at Apple are trying to push very hard to make the um, iPhone the center of your authentication world. Um, I actually use Dual. Um, because that's what the University of Hawaii standardized on. And so I add different things. It's been a amazing pain um, when I changed from the iPhone 6S over to the iPhone 12 Pro. Um, moving my authenticator apps was actually really painful. So um, I think one of the things the industry is forgetting is that people don't like changing because of sticks. You know, the old carrot versus the stick. Users don't like changing. They don't like change, period. And there needs to be an advantage to them. And my personal opinion is we need a standard. We need a standard that works across multiple platforms. None of this Apple only or Android only or whatever. Um, there needs to be a better solution. It needs to be an industry standard, so we need to go and get people to quit arguing and start cooperating. And there needs to be a carrot. And it is my opinion that if we had a device that could be used um, by the general public, that maybe you stick your thumb, you know, your biometric authentication on a dongle, and then you can kind of use it with Bluetooth or a tap and go or something like that um, so that people can give up on passwords. Um, because everybody that I've talked to, jo almost without fail, hate passwords, you know, especially having to change them. That, that's the number one pain point for users that I've dealt with. So if there was a standard that's cross-platform, that's easy to use, I think that's a, enough of a carrot to get people to move. And I'd like to see that happen. But you know what? We, we need something change. We, it needs to have, uh, it needs to be easy. It needs to be something that manufacturers can agree upon. And I applaud what Apple is doing. But the fact that they're using it as a marketing lever to get people over to the iPhone platform is the wrong move. And I, I one last thing. Um, folks, there are lots and lots of places where you're not allowed to take a phone. Try, you know, some banks, you're not allowed to have a phone. A lot of, um, confident, you know, actual intellectual property, confidential research, you're not allowed to have a phone. Um, the military, you're not allowed to have a phone. Um, so it needs to be something that is dedicated to being a, an authentication dongle that doesn't have general use functions is a more palatable answer. Now, I realize that's, you know, a fairly small minority, but it's a very powerful minority. And when you have the military adopt something, all of a sudden it becomes a de facto standard. So... Yeah, it's got to be done. Yes, we're sounding like a broken record. Um, but this is probably the number one uh, bugaboo in our industry. And we are not going to move forward until we can start solving these problems. So there. Agreed 100%. Thank you, Chibert. Well, folks, that does it for the bites. Next up, we're going to discuss in depth a little bit about 5G and as well as private 5G. But before we get to that, we do have to thank another great sponsor of This Week Enterprise Tech. 
and that's Hover. It's time to make plans and let Hover help you achieve them. If you're a blogger, creating a portfolio, building an online store, or you just want to make a more memorable redirect to your LinkedIn page, Hover has the best domains and email addresses just for you. An email at your domain name is key to connecting with customers and building trust for your brand. They have domain-based emails for all of your needs, small or large. It's easy to set up. You can add as many mailboxes to your domain as you need. And when your domain renews, your mailboxes will too. Now, the prices are unbeatable. Their most popular mailbox is a no-brainer solution for your business owners. Get access from anywhere. Use your email app you're already comfortable with. Or if apps aren't your thing, their web mail can be accessed wherever you are. Now, personally, I really like Hover's ease of use. They have a huge collection of TLDs, plus super easy to transfer. That's right. makes my life easier. If you ever tried to transfer using some of the other guys out there, it's kind of a headache. Now, Hover isn't here to upsell you or or on your stuff you don't need. They just want to help you. That's right. They have pro-level tools, powerful domain and email management tools that are intuitive and easy to use, whether you're a web pro or just getting started. But it's, it's private and secure with the who is privacy protection included with your domain purchase. Your private information will remain just that, private. And it's a great way to reduce spam and protect yourself from unwanted solicitations. Plus, Hover Connect lets you pick the service you want to use to build and host your web app and website as well. Connect helps you start with using your domain name with just a couple clicks. Now at Hover, you're a customer and not a source of data. Take back control of your data with reliable track-free email. Hover is trusted by hundreds of thousands of customers who use the domain names and emails to turn their ideas into reality. Whether you're a developer, photographer, or small business, Hover has something for you to expand your projects and get the visibility you want. Go to hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of your domain extension for the entire first year. That's hover.com slash twit for 10% off your domain extension for a full year. And we thank Hover for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now time for our host roundtable. Now, we've discussed 5G in the past, but we haven't really discussed the private 5G side of things. The, the, we talked about public networks and how some of our mobile public networks are moving to 5G, but there's a lot of applications for private 5G. Chibert, Chibert, I want to throw this to you just first to, to kind of give us an understanding. What is fi- private 5G? What does it mean? And how far does it go down the line here? Well, the marketing definitions are blurry. You know, any new technology, marketing folks aren't going to always check with their engineers before they start using labels. So, sadly, 5G has also come to include the 60 gigahertz um, world that if you look at the tech specs and, you know, what it can do and so forth, it actually looks like more like a replacement for Wi-Fi point-to-point or point-to-multipoint shots. So, Working with that, you know, de facto definition, um, I actually got a chance to physically work with Seeklu Corporation. We've actually had them on the show. They started doing some of the very first um, fixed 5G, and they had 60 gigahertz point-to-point and point-to-multipoint devices um, that gave you upwards of 10 gig wireless backbones. And it's great because then you can have a 10 gig wireless link between your buildings um, and so forth. Now, some of the very earliest 60 gigahertz stuff that I actually saw was actually at the Sony Open. Um, One of the biggest problems with golf tournaments that are televised is they really hate those big cables run across the fairways and greens on very high-end country clubs. And so I actually saw a Sony Corporation play with some, um, you know, very early prototypes of 60 gigahertz devices that will shoot from the greens and from the fairways where they had their cameras back to the production truck. So private 
G. And in this case, this is actually a newest, one of the newest offerings from Microtech. That's actually 60 gigahertz with a 5 gigahertz backup, uh, which has made them super popular. I can't get my hands on a set because they keep selling out. Anyway, private 5G is not just what used to be called bypass wireless, meaning you're bypass bypassing the phone companies or the lease line companies and so forth. Bypass wireless means I don't want to have to pay someone for that link. It also mean, has come to mean I can't dig up the street um, super popular in high density areas like New York, Tokyo, San Francisco, and so forth. In fact, um, we actually did some wireless bypass in Tokyo, and it was literally to get across the street. And we just literally we stuck it inside the windows and shot across the street, and saved ourselves an amazing amount of money. So bypass wireless should be lumped in with this also. How do we get from one point to another without having to spend a lot of money? Lastly, before I finish this rant, um, there is now private 5G that you can buy that is cellular-like in operation. Uh, so if you have a 5G phone, say we actually had someone on the show where you literally just scan a QR code with your iPhone and it will set up a separate um, eSIM, electronic SIM, so that you could use the private um, 5G network that you set up with your your uh, your vendor. And the cool thing is because it's licensed, and normally the vendors that do set up uh, handle the licensing for you, you can um, avoid some of the interference that you get with an unlicensed band. So keep in mind, 60 gigahertz is just like Wi-Fi at 5 gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz. It is unlicensed. And in all reality, if someone happens to have something on the same channel that's flooding or spilling over into your dishes, you're out of luck. Whereas true private 5G, when it's 5G mobile or cellular, or whichever word you like, um, those are licensed. So the a lot of the vendors that are offering private 5G are saying, we can give you something dramatically more reliable um, and lower latency than your Wi-Fi. And that's why, in some cases, people are putting these in. Uh, a big one are hospitals. Another big one is finance. They're actually um, because they want the privacy. Um, healthcare, oh, sorry, I said healthcare. And campus, you know, academics having a separate, secure, uh, cellular like um, infrastructure for, say, like campus security or something like that. So it's changing the way things are going. It's no longer going to be, oh, immediately let's do a Wi-Fi network. Now there's some new options uh, right. to be able to avoid digging. Um, and especially in some large high-density cities like New York or Tokyo, getting permission to dig up the street is challenging. Um, so wireless bypass has gotten lumped in and I think it should stay that way at least for a little while until people start understanding um, private 5G better. It's true, it's true. Now, there are some conspiracies that come along a little bit with the 5G and the 60 gigahertz ban as well. What are, what are some of those conspiracies? In fact, if you go searching on Reddit, it's really the only thing that you find about around 5G, 60 gigahertz. What, uh, what's going on there? What, uh, what, do you, what can you guys tell me? <laughs> It's it's tinfoil hat people. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> now five G, well sixty gigahertz. That's that's contrary on sixty gigahertz because the, there's a lot of conspiracy on sixty gigahertz. Keep in mind sixty gigahertz. The 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 RF signal is small enough and high frequency enough that oxygen gets in the way. So we're talking um, very short range. So being able to shoot down a back alley or across the street or maybe, you know, daisy chain across campus, that's fine. And we're talking about things that are very 
low power. So to the tinfoil hat people, um, <laughs> you get more radiation exposure from that microwave in your home. Actually, you get more radiation exposure from a nice sunny day. Um, that's my that's opinion, right. but you know, there's an awful lot of scientists behind me. <laughs> that's right. Thank you, Cheever. Yeah, I think that the interesting thing that I find with private 5G especially is just the the, the amount of applications. And I want to I want to get your guys' thoughts on some of these applications. But one thing I saw that's you know really interesting personal experience here is you know I worked in I worked in a brewery for a while as a systems control engineer. And one of the things that they had was pretty advanced at the time was autonomous vehicles that they were actually moving around the brewery and the and the warehouse to move pallets of beer on and off trucks and being able to. Uh, pick up the the latest um, you know brewed beer and move it into the uh, into the cooling facilities and that was all done autonomously and the way they used to do it was actually through uh, really expensive uh, magnetic tracks that they had put into the cement um, but because they had to expand the brewery that got more expensive and 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 they just couldn't continue to maintain that and so they moved more towards wireless technology and and more using AI. Uh, to be able to to be able to move these things around, and the challenge there was there was a lot of disruption. There's some sometimes uh, those the, the wireless could be um, interrupted by other devices in the different spectrum, especially with you know Wi-Fi uh, the way it is today. And so moving towards the applications using 5G, they get a little bit more reliability because of the fact that. Um, they can move in between public and private networks pretty easily. Um, they have uh, it's easy to move throughout the the shop floor or the or the organization's floor or the warehouse, um, and allows these these vehicles to be able to communicate at high speed at much lower power. So I definitely feel like that is a really good application, uh, which is in the industrial case or the manufacturing case. Uh, case, but Curtis, I want to throw this to you because you, you you talk to a lot of industries out there, a lot of organizations. What other some what are some of the other applications you're seeing uh, from the uh, private five G case? Well, obviously, as you pointed out, uh, OT our operational technology is a big one. This is where you're doing shop floor, where you're doing all sorts of industrial control, those sorts of things. Uh, they are very, very big. Uh, you're also seeing it used to replace uh, what tends to be known as MPLS or private cabled links um, on uh, inside city, not necessarily campus, but uh, citywide networks uh, for a lot of the reasons that Brian was talking about. Um, you know, I think that where you're going to see uh, a real takeover is the MPLS or lease line um, market. You know, you'll still have some very big pipes that have to be leased, but for a lot of the smaller, 5G is the way to go for a whole variety of reasons. And one of those, it has to be noted, does include, in most cases, security. Um especially on the OT side, uh, the security of networks are notoriously bad, largely because a lot of the engineers have typically said, why would anyone want to get into our network? And the answer is so that they can laterally move into the rest of your IT network and also hold your uh, operational technology uh, subject to ransomware and such. But 5G has better protection. I uh, won't say it's uh, hack-proof. It's ha a little bit more hack-resistant uh, than a standard cable. Um, but you do have a lot of interesting possibilities. And I, I do want to bring up one of the things <clears throat> that is really interesting with 5G on the healthcare side. Um the security of healthcare devices is really tricky. And the big reason is that the software used on healthcare devices, regulated healthcare devices, we're not talking about like the, uh, the home blood pressure cuffs, but, you know, CAT scan machines, things like that. The software is part of the approved device. Therefore, if you change the software, you have to go through a renewed 
approval process. These are horrifically expensive and can take quite a long time. And so the manufacturers are highly reluctant to do updates to the firmware, the software on those machines. That's one of the reasons why they become quite susceptible right. to intrusions. Now, if you can take the networking layer one away from cables and especially away from commodity internet and turn it over to something like private 5G, you have the opportunity to put some privacy controls and some security controls in at the network edge to protect the devices that sit there on the device edge. And that's a key component to why a lot of healthcare organizations are looking strongly at private 5G because they do allow for some security protection that's just not available if you're running everything over commodity internet. Indeed, indeed. Well, there's, there's lots more to talk about here, but I do want to, we have to go one more to sponsor and then when we come back, we have some more to talk about, about, you know, even 5G as a service. But before we get to that, let's go ahead and thank another great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech. And that's Thinks Canary. Now, if there's anything we've learned from the last year is that companies must make it a priority to layer the security of their networks. That's right, add layers. And one of these layers needs to be Thinks Canary. Unfortunately, companies usually find out too late that they've been compromised, even after they've already spent millions of dollars on IT security. Now, attackers are sneaky. We know that. Unknown to companies, they prowl networks looking for valuable data. While attackers browse Active Directory for file servers, explore file shares, they will be looking for documents. They'll try default passwords against network devices and web services, and they'll scan for open services across your network. Well, things canaries are designed to look like the things that hackers want to get to. Canaries can be deployed throughout your entire network, and you can make them look identical. Identical to a router, a switch, a NAS server, a Linux box, a Windows server, so attackers won't know they've been caught. You can name them in the ways that the hackers, it gets their attention, right? You can enroll them in an Active Directory, and when attackers investigate further, they give themselves away. The Canary tokens act as tiny tripwires that can be dropped into hundreds of places. Canary is designed to be installed and configured in minutes, and you won't have to think about them again. And if an alert happens, Canary will notify you any way you want. You can alerts by email or text message on your console through Slack, Webhook, Syslog, or even their just user API. Now, data breaches happen typ typically through your staff. And when they do, companies often don't know they've been compromised. And it takes an average of 191 days for a company to realize that there's been a data breach. Now, Canary solves that problem. Canary was created by people who train companies, militaries, and governments on how to break into networks. And with that knowledge, they built Canary. You'll find Canaries deployed all over the world and are one of the best tools against data breaches. Visit canary.tools slash twit and for $7,500 per year, you'll get five Canaries, your own hosted console, upgrade support, and maintenance. And if you use code twit in the how do you hear about us box, you'll get 10% off the price for life. We know you'll love your things canary, but if you're not happy, you can always return your canaries with their two month money back guarantee for a full refund. That's canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the how do you hear about us box. And we thank things canary, their support of this week in enterprise tech. <clears throat> well, folks, we've been talking about 5G and private 5G, some of the applications out there and even some of the conspiracies behind it. But there are some interesting things here as well because you know net, 5G being implemented requires some additional layering in your network. Is that right, Schubert? Uh, to an extent. Um, a private 5G system, uh, when you're talking about bypass wireless, it looks like wire. It, that's all it is. So any kind of separation and extra security you implement uh, with your existing network infrastructure. Now, when you start talking about 5G, private 5G in the cellular world, then yeah, there's a bunch of things involved and it's basically implementing, think of the hassle you went through implementing a PBX. It's similar. <laughs> um, there's some interesting things. Now, one of the things 
yeah, there's a there's a good place to start. We're going. I'm hoping these URLs make it into the show notes. But one of the things that I stumbled across during research for this show was an offering from Nippon Telephone and Telegraph (NTT), and it's 5G as a service. Now, again, uh, in the in the world where we're starting to merge the telecom group and the IT group. Um, nine times out of 10, you're, you're not given more people. So the as a service has been very, very popular with all kinds of different IT or telecom organizations and being able to lose the hassle of managing a private 5G infrastructure, um, at least in Japan, means that, gee, I, I can outsource that and then... All we have to do is work on getting a gateway inside our our um, network um, that is then usually protected through an encrypted VPN link or sometimes lease lines. I'm not quite sure how um, NTT has offered the <clears throat> connection back into your private network, but I suspect those are going to be um, some of the offerings. I hear rumblings from AT&T and T-Mobile and Verizon that this is a uh, market that they'd like to tap eventually. I got to imagine part of the problem is the American um, FCC. Um, the Japanese, especially NTT, has some advantages. The Japanese government, in this case, especially in this case, is very pro-business. And I worked with Fujitsu Limited in Japan, and they had very close ties to NTT. And there are some really cool things that happened. Now, for those of you that are listening, um, I do want to say one thing. Private cellular systems, which is what we're really talking about, have been around for a long time. There are lots and lots and lots of roadblocks to implementing them. Um... But I actually had one that was off a uh, communications van in Bosnia, and I just had a crank up mast, and I actually was running an Ericsson 2G cellular system. And because we were under NATO, um, I actually got to bypass a lot of those issues. But the cool thing is, and this also applies to the private 5G, is a lot of these systems actually allow you to do segmentation of your clients. Uh, so you can push messaging out, you can push updates. Um, there's a lot of really cool things that you can do with a private 5G system. And it was just starting to appear in private 2G. Uh, I used it for NATO so that I could send out SMS alerting uh, from the command structure in the correct language because I could group people by languages. Um, so it's been around for a while. And I got to imagine that as the private 5G vendors start learning how to market this stuff, we're going to start seeing a lot of really cool ways of segmenting your employees or segmenting your teams, um, whether it's robots doing stocking or whether it's humans um, doing healthcare, there's going to be some interesting things. And the day of IT and telecom being separate, I think, is gone. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. It's going to be fun. I find some interesting questions that kind of come up in my mind. I'm wondering if you guys maybe can help me. Now, some organizations come out there, they say, hey, we want to have, we want to add more reliability to our network, uh, whether it's in an industrial setting or whatnot. And today they add Wi-Fi and sometimes use a backhaul that, or, or a backup network that is essentially maybe wireless or Wi-Fi or, or even, like you said, 4G, 5G. What is, what is the advantage of just going directly to 5G, 60 gigahertz in this case, um, and just using that regardless of the Wi-Fi there and, um, and then having to switch over when there's failover? What, is there an advantage to that? Or should is organizations who already have it, should they just switch or should they just keep what they have and, and if you're starting new, try to go to this new model? Ooh, tough one. I'm going to toss this to Kurt because Kurt's, Kurt's got the ham radio background. Um, well, there's I think, actually a pretty big difference between Wi-Fi and uh, 60 gigahertz, and he's prepared. He's 
got the skills. Yeah, the 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 big thing about sixty gig is that, as Brian has mentioned, you have things like oxygen and especially moisture in the air. If you're if you're humid, um, sixty gig is attenuated pretty heavily as it goes any distance. Now, with that said, if you are piggybacking your private five G on uh, say a metropolitan uh, carrier's 5G deployment, then you've got lots and lots of, of the, the little microcells to, to carry you different places. So the, the good side about 5G is that it directly hooks into wider area networks. You don't have to have an, an additional gateway that goes from your local area network to your wide area network. Um, you can typically have a wider variety of network access devices because, you know, face it, I, it, it's interesting. I'll show how old I am. I can remember when you actually had to buy an add-in card to get Wi-Fi for your laptop or desktop computer. And there were a bunch of them. Now, face it, you take the Wi-Fi that's built into your computer or your smart device. Uh, you don't think about adding on uh, Wi-Fi. With 5G, you tend to think about adding it on so you can be more deliberate about what you do. Now, Wi-Fi is always going to be somewhat cheaper at the end point, but when you look at wide area network that um, doesn't require a gateway and the security provided by 60 gigahertz over any of the frequencies that Wi-Fi is currently operating on, um, you can see that there can be some pretty compelling arguments for moving over to, to private 5G for your metropolitan um, networking. I do want to throw this one more time to the cheaper because cheaper. I was, you know, thinking about this as I was thinking about adoption for organizations, and you know, I was thinking this has got to be expensive, right? Is there some cheaper options? Actually, um, the sixty gigahertz solution. One of the sixty gigahertz solutions from Microtik, our friends in Latvia. They have a system. Go just go on Amazon and search for wireless wire. Um, the wireless wire system actually comes now in three different flavors. They're actually packaged together with two sides. You know the, the near side, far side, all ready to go, all pre-set up. Literally, you turn it on and you go. Uh, oh, I think you got to go and put some passwords on them, but that's about it. Um, so the short range with the um, 90 degree panel antennas, um, you can actually get a set for $125. And those will shoot maybe six to 800 feet. They have a similar system, also called wireless wire, but with parabolic antennas that are three degrees. Uh, so you got to take a lot more time aiming them. Those can shoot multiple miles. And then the last one was their new cube um, is the one that I talked about that is 60 gigahertz, but with a five gigahertz fallback. Um, I'm not quite sure what their, um, the price on the cubes are going to be, but I actually bought a set of parabolics to go from the Pacific Basin Research Center roof over to a bathroom at Point Panic, which is a surf spot, uh, so we could link up the uh, new underwater observatory. That was under 300 bucks for a set, uh, including mounting brackets, which is pretty cool. Not bad. Yeah, for, for a small business, that's not too bad, actually. I was thinking it was going to be thousands of dollars. So that's actually not, I mean, I paid thousands of dollars for a, for a Wi-Fi 6 system that didn't even work. I ended up sending it back. So that's yeah, actually pretty actually, inexpensive. The low-end wireless wire, um, I've actually used it to shoot across streets through windows, and they work just fine. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. 
Well, guys, time flies when you're having fun. And these host roundtables are a lot of fun. Great topic today. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. So, folks, you've done it again. You've sat through another hour of the best thing, enterprise, IT, and podcasts in the universe. So definitely tune your podcaster to Twyat. We thank you very much to do that. And, of course, subscribe. But I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to our co-host. Sorry, guys, our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming week? Where can people find you? Well, I'm going to be sitting at my desk doing a lot of uh, research and writing up a big research project that's due out in the middle of July. Also be getting ready for Dar- uh, for Black Hat and the uh, Omnia Analyst Summit. Uh, in addition to Black Hat, I am going to be sticking around and attending uh, DEF CON. So if anybody in the Twilight Riot is going to be at either Black Hat or DEF CON, we'd love to uh, meet you face-to-face. Uh, could be really interesting to get together. Um, and I'll have some articles coming up on dark reading and, of course, for our subscribers at Omdia. So uh, lots of words are going to be pouring out of my keyboard over the next few weeks before I hit the road again. Thank you, sir. Looking forward to all those words. Appreciate it, Curtis. Well, we also want to thank our very own Mr. Brian Chi as well. Chi, it's great to see you, my friend. Where can people find you? Where can people get a hold of you? I'm Grab me on Twitter. I'm A-D-V-N-E-T, L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab, on Twitter. And, uh, you know, we've been throwing all kinds of stuff out. Actually, if you've been following me on Twitter, you actually saw um, Duke Energy replacing the power pole behind my home. I was actually sitting there, you know, taking snaps and watching them do it. And they put a new transformer up and all that, all getting ready to go and feed a new underground power system. So that was kind of interesting to watch. Um, also, you know, f- feel free. I'm, I'd am i love to hear show ideas from you folks, especially on host roundtables that you might want to hear in the future. If it's something that I can research and get us background on or something that the other guys, are, uh, guys or girl, he- Heather uh, Williams is definitely one of our team, um, we'll go and see because I'm going to try very hard to go and put more host roundtables into the schedule. Uh, because the feedback from you folks has been that you like them. Um, so I can also be reached on email, chebert, C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T, at twit.tv, or better yet, throw email at twyatt at twit.tv, and that'll hit all the hosts. We'd love to hear your ideas. We'd love to hear your comments. And um, take care, everybody, and stay safe. You too as well. Take care, Chebert. Well, we also have to thank you as well. You are the person who drops in each and every week to get your enterprise goodness. We want to make it easy for you to watch the show and catch up and listen on Get Your Enterprise and IT News. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twit. It's really easy. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information, the guest information, of course, the links that we do during the show as well. But more importantly, next to those videos, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice, and listen on any one of your devices or any one of your applications, your podcast applications, because we're on all of them, Podcatcher, Apple Podcast, YouTube, you name it. We're there. Subscribe. We love to have your support and plus you may have also heard we also have club twit as well that's right it's a members only ad free podcast service with a bonus twit plus fee that you can't get anywhere else and it's only seven dollars a month and you get a lot of great things with club Twit. in fact you get exclusive access to the members only discord server you can chat with hosts and producers separate discussion channels plus they also have a lot of special events on there too you definitely should check that out join club twit and be part of that movement be part of that fun go to twit.tv slash club twit plus you may have also heard we also have corporate group plans for club twit as well that's right it's a great way to give your team access to our ad free tech podcasts the plan started at just five members at a discounted rate of just $6 each per month, and you can get as many seats as you like added there. This is a great way for your IT departments, your sales departments, your developers, your tech teams to stay up to date with access to all of our podcasts. And just like the regular membership, you can join the Twit Discord server as well and get that Twit Plus bonus feed as well. So definitely join Club Twit, twit.tv slash Club Twit. After you subscribe, 
definitely impress your friends, your coworkers, your family members with the gift of Twiat and Twit. Uh, We talk a lot of fun tech topics on this show, and I guarantee they will find it fun and interesting as well. So definitely give them a gift of Twiat and have them listen and subscribe. Now, after you subscribed, if you're available on Fridays at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time, we do this show live. Come see how it's made behind the scenes. Come see how the pizza's made, all the fun stuff, the banter that we do during and before and after the show. Of course, it's at live.twit.tv. There's all the streams on there. There's YouTube streams and all the streams. So go to live.twit.tv. Of course, if you want to watch the show live, you might as well jump into the chat room live as well. We have a live chat room, irc.twit.tv. All the amazing characters that are in there. There they are. We have uh, Gumby. We have Loquacious. We have uh, Reberg Mike. We have Chicken Head. We have everybody in there. Wag G. We have so many characters, new ones every week. Returning ones, they have some great conversations. We have a lot of fun. In fact, we get some really great uh, show titles from them as well. So thank you guys for being there. Definitely join the chat room, irc.twit.tv. Definitely hit me up if you are on Twitter during the day, at night, whatever. Hit me up on twitter.com slash loumm. There I post all my enterprise tidbits. I have some great discussions. Direct message me for I show ideas, whatever. Lot, let's discuss. Let's have some good conversations. Twitter.com slash Lou MM. If you're interested in my normal work week at Microsoft, you can always check out all that work at developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we post all the latest and greatest ways for you to customize your office experience, even use some newer technologies like TypeScript using our new product called Office Script. You can create online macros and actually generate JavaScript TypeScript from a macro and actually run it in Power BI. Uh, automate whenever you want. So really kind of fun stuff, really cool stuff for you to do. So definitely check that out. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support these week on Rise Tech each and every week. And we really couldn't do the show without them. So thank you guys for all your support over the years. And I also want to thank all the engineers and staff at Twit. I also want to thank Mr. Brian Chi just one more time. He's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer as well. He does all the bookings for the show and the plannings for the show, and we really couldn't do it without him. So thank you, Chibert, for all your support. Now, before we sign out, we also have to thank our editor for today. He's Kevin. He's Mr. Kevin. He's, he's the behind-the-scenes master at making us look good after the fact. So thank you for your support, Kevin, and all your help. And, of course, we also have to thank our TD for today. He's our talented Mr. Ant Pruitt, and he does an amazing fabulous show called hands-on photography where i learn new things each week about photography editing all fun stuff and what's going on this week in hands-on photography well mr lou i uh, talked about your first paid photography gig but Ooh. i'm gonna put that to the side just for a second i just want to say uh women out there there are a lot of men that are not in leadership and we support you and we got your back and that's all i'm gonna say on that Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Well, until next time, I'm Louis Moresco, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Is that an iPhone in your hand? Wait a second. Is that an Apple Watch on your wrist? And do I, do I see an iPad sitting there on the table? Oh, my goodness. You are the perfect person to be watching iOS Today, the show where Rosemary Orchard and I, Micah Sargent, talk all things iOS, tvOS, watchOS, HomePodOS. It's all the OSs that Apple has on offer, and we show you how to make the most of those gadgets. Just head to twit.tv iOS to check it out.